6.30, so we're going to start our evening session for Parent Maps Every Child Summit. So welcome to everyone, and we are joined by Dr. Laura Kastner, who is going to give us a talk, Getting to Calm While Pandemic Parenting. Dr. Kastner is a friend and a clinical psychologist and professor at the University of Washington. She's conducted research, maintained a clinical practice, and presented numerous workshops for parents. Dr. Kastner has authored and co-authored five books, including the very popular title published by Parent Map called Getting to Calm. My name is Elaine Sulkin, and I'm honored to be here tonight, both as publisher of Parent Map and the moderator tonight. I'm the very proud mama to three adult children and the bubby to one little two month old girl and a two month old little boy. So grandchildren, which is super fun. For those of you that might not be familiar with Parent Map, we are a robust content uh, site and magazine to help you on your parenting journey. We would like to, dis to describe the content that we provide somewhere between broccoli and nutritional popcorn. Broccoli being a lot of what we've been putting out today, which is health development and wellness and education. And then nutritional popcorn, which is all the fabulous fun adventures that you can do with your family. So um, check out our books and website. Before we turn it over to Dr. Kastner, a few housekeeping items. Um, this will be recorded so that we can put it on our site and share it and use it in the future. And then we also invite you to use the Q&A at the bottom of your screen during the course of Dr. Kastner's talk. And when she's done, I will be um, feeding questions her way. So with that, I would like to turn it over to Dr. Kastner. Thank you. And thank you, Elaine. It's so nice that you're my moderator tonight. I'm excited about that. Um, you can be sure that uh, Elaine and I will be have a spirited exchange because we know each other so well. Um, welcome to everybody. And I want to thank Brenna and Elaine and the whole crew at uh, Parent Mount that uh, sponsored this event. And when way back, oh gosh, Elaine, I forgot when the first uh, Getting to Calm book was published maybe 2007, and then there's this series. When we when we used that title, uh, of course, we had no idea how apropos it would be for the pandemic and everything we need for the pandemic. Uh, these three books, I just want to say that the, the, this book is for parents of three to seven-year-olds, and these two books, Getting to Calm, Cool-Headed Strategies for Parenting Tweens and Teens, and Wise-Minded Parents, Parenting, you want to know more about them, Q&A is fine. I'll tell you what makes them different, why you should buy them. But um, uh, these are for tweens and teens, and this one is uh, is for uh, parents of, um, of a three to seven-year-olds. So on our topic, I'm, I want to cover three things uh, in about 45 minutes, and then we'll go to Q&A. Uh, most of you are um, kind of sophisticated enough, if you got this far, to sign up for an evening. Uh, webinar, you've probably been reading other literature on pandem pandemic parenting. And I want to specifically now take all that you've read in the kind of simple articles and really specifically have you think about what does this crisis mean for me and my family? And what specifically do I want to work on? But at that same time, I want to talk about acceptance of how you are and just exactly how you are, as well as change. Because some people are trying to change so much with the stress going on that um, they need to kind of flip it over to maybe just accepting uh, self-acceptance a lot more rather than a change uh, agenda. We wanna talk about self-care and we wanna talk about some strategies. Um, so I'm gonna just start very briefly on the fact that I wrote this article for Parent Map way back at the end of March. That's a long time ago, eight months and counting. Um, and you might say, well, wait a minute, you're gonna, how did you know to write all these stages about adaptation and adjustment to the pandemic way back at the end of March? The answer is psychologists have been studying crises, challenging circumstances, disasters for 30, 40 years. So there's research we can bring to you on how to adapt to a crisis. Uh, when you think about the birth of a um, child with a disability, when you think about hurricanes and floods, when you think about 
you know, the forest, the, the fires in, in uh, California that might take a home, all of those have to do with a disaster hitting a family and then how do they adapt optimally? There's research on this. How do the families that adapt the best uh, address their challenges? So the first thing that happens in an emergency, of course, there's shock and awe. This couldn't possibly be happening. It is, there's the protests. They certainly won't call off schools. And then they did. And then that, you know, with the cascading news that comes out about um, what this uh, pandemic means, scientifically, we start to understand um, how to respond. Um, in the next phase, I call it lurch, like, you know, one of those roller coasters that kind of jolts you back and forth. Uh, first, we had lockdown, then the urgency of social distancing, which of course is still going on every day. You use up some of your mental capacity to think, how you know, do I make my family safe? Um, risk assessment again is going on and it will till the very end of this. Uh, might even with vaccination, since it might not you know, be more like a flu vaccination than a measles prevention of disease. And there'll still be calculations of how safe am I and how safe is my, is my family. I uh, have a sub uh, acronym here. I call it RATS, uh, Risk Assessment Tolerance Safety Precautions, RATS. We go through this constantly all day. Every time you let one of your kids go do something, you're thinking, okay, um, what is the implication for the safety for my family? You're figuring in your own vulnerability. If they're health conditions, you're thinking about how much you trust the other family. Uh, what uh, you're, Maybe you have a pandemic pod. If one travels, if one goes to work, if they have a change in circumstance, you're constantly using mental capacity for figuring out safety. And that next one is checking. Checking on uh, the pod, checking on what people are doing. Is my family safe? It almost makes a little bit of a OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder out of all of us. Um, it's good in about this much. At this much, you don't have a life. All you're doing is worrying. Um, so we have to kind of keep it down to you know, a good size. On the other hand, we churn a lot with worrying. Uh, hoarding, of course, was really prominent in the spring. Uh, it's better now. We're not all talking about N95s and rice beans and um, and toilet paper. On the other hand, if there was a supply chain difficulty, uh, we'd see it come right back. Okay, I'm gonna spend most of my time on this part. I think you know how important uh, social connections, rich family you know, connections and, and uh, contact is. Um, we all know about Zoom, you're on Zoom tonight. Um, some of you now have uh, taken on some rituals with your family of every Sunday you do this and that with family members that um, are far away. And of course, we're all trying to figure out how we get more in-person contact that might be safe, you know, whether it's outside, we have more disease right now, of course, because people are going inside and we're, we all have pandemic fatigue, which means a lot of people are taking more chances with the risk assessment and and exposure. Uh, the next one is organization. And of course, some of you are lucky enough to have children that love organization. They like to have things just so and they can kind of do some of their remote learning all by themselves. And isn't that lovely for you? But most people have a certain amount of this every day, um, where especially with, with gadgets, where you're arguing about the, the schedule and, and uh, trying to keep a certain amount of routine and of course, it's not always going to work out. Um, you know, life is what happens when we're busy making plans. I've always liked that phrase. Life is what happens when we're busy making plans because plans, uh, plans are going to be upended on, on a regular basis. On the other hand, I'm a big prom uh, promote. Oh, well, here's one. We all do, you know, want to start out as Glinda, but we end up as the Wicked Witch. So that'll probably be what we spend most of our time on is that our intentions to stay cool and uh, cool-headed and calm go out the window when we're triggered. So we'll talk about that at length in a minute. Um, but I wanted to um, say schedules like this, I'm a big believer in uh, whiteboards um, because uh, children can see them. We can make sure we've got goals on there of you know physical exercise, calm time, reading time, remote learning for your children in school. Um, and you know, all of the talks have, I mean, excuse me, all the articles and talks that you might've listened to um, say the same thing about schedules and organization and routines. And I'm always um, 
surprised that more people don't talk about the neuroscience. They talk about children love routines, you know, that they like predictability. We like them to be secure. It promotes security and that's true. But there, another whole reason to promote uh, routines is that we can, um, when we do the same thing the same way every day, they literally become almost like automatic pilot. The example I always use is when we back out of the car, I mean, back our car out of the driveway, can you tell my driveway is right there? Um, you, you don't even think about it. You're, you're kind of backing up and you can drink your coffee, listen to the rest, you know, radio and have a conversation at the same time because it's literally relegated once it's routinized, it's relegated to the basal ganglia to be specific, but it's, a, it's the uh, muscle motor sort of, you know, limbic system area that sort of just runs you, uh, runs the whole system for you. Our children are very much the same way. Once you do the evening routine and the morning routine the same way, and you have one of these schedules, of course, it's, it's not airtight. There's all sorts of, you know, mess that happens. But a certain amount, and I'm sure all of you know, especially with the evening routine, you know, first we brush your teeth, or then we do the, the bathing, then we do the three stories, and then we do the three kinds of kisses or, you know, whatever it is. And that, and that really helps them kind of do it without thinking. And you get a lot more cooperation and a lot less fighting over decision-making. Like less, I know that it's upended, but it, it, it's going to be much easier if there is a schedule. So organization, okay, you get the point. Okay, now perspective, a big one. All of you probably know this Escher by now. Uh, some of you saw him immediately, oh, there's the young woman's you know, face and the you know, eyelash. And some of you saw the old lady with her Crohn's nose and her mouth there in the, in the fur. So they're both true, right? They're both, the, depending on your perspective, you can go back and forth. Okay, that's the same thing with the pandemic is that we, we really want to talk about this is awful and validate all of your feelings about negative emotions are valid. I hope you take some time for them, write about them, have your 15 minutes three times a day to just sit with them and accept them. They will come, they will go. No emotion stays. Okay, it's just like anxiety. Anxiety goes up and it always comes down. So part of it is accepting a radical acceptance of feeling so that, you know, you can also move on without fighting them and then go on to a different part of your day. We're going to talk about coping. But the people that, you know, one of my, I always mention Viktor Frankl because I read him my freshman year of college. Maybe some of you did too. And uh, the Holocaust is such a good example of, of a person like him that was in the concentration camps, he comes out, he writes this book called Man's Search for Meaning. What is the meaning of this catastrophe? Because he took the position of, I am choosing to survive and thrive. I'm making that choice. He's famous for saying or, or writing about the phenomenon that you can have an event like the Holocaust or the pandemic. You'll have a reaction, but you can have a pause and that is the freedom to choose an attitude or perspective. So the pause, getting to calm pause and choosing will be what we talk about the rest of the evening. So taking the pause. So he, his whole concept that he's famous for is take the pause as much as you can so you have the freedom to make a choice on how you behave, how you handle a situation, how you handle the pandemic. So the, you know, hit the, uh, mindset that we really want to promote here with resilience and in studying the, the um, families that have been the most resilient and their children are, we will get through this. At the end of this year, I want to look back and have something I'm proud of. I can choose right now to have a project, a mission, hopefully a small and, uh, and realistic one. And I'll be proud of that. We will get through this. You know, um, uh, whether it's Katrina or, uh, uh, you know, your, your whole village went, you know, was burnt, uh, or you have uh, two children born with uh, cerebral palsy. These are, are very dramatic examples of people that had a, a crisis and then, you know, have to adapt to it. And I'm so thankful for all the time I've worked at Children's Hospital with, and then my original research was on diabetes, asthma, assisted fibrosis and, um, and hearing impairment. So I got to have hundreds of hours with families that had these conditions teaching me 
how they came to resilience, how they came to you know, uh, rise to the occasion and say, we are going to make the best of this. We're gonna c- control the best, uh, control what we can control. And, and many people say, how in the world can they do that? And when I would interview them for some of the residents, uh, the pediatric residents at uh, Children's Hospital, they say, I'd stop making me a hero. What would you do if you had a child with one of these diseases? You'd rise the occasion and try to do the best you could because you love your children. And that's what we're doing now. And they want to always make, they have terrible days. They have, you know, terrible moments. So they're, you know, we, we all need to know that we'll have terrible moments and terrible days. And we can still rise the occasion with that pause to choose how to make things just a little bit better. So now to to uh, talk about endurance. Um, I, you know, I almost didn't uh, include this in my acronym back in March, but I knew from these families that, um, that there needs to be an acceptance. Well, let me just define uh, endurance from the Wikipedia. It's the acceptance of unpleasant circumstances over a prolonged period of time. That doesn't sound very good. You know, Americans love to be optimistic and we love to get rid of things and get over things and get through things. And this is something where actually we need some acceptance that it will last a long time. And one day at a time, we'll just do the best we can. So I put this other photo up as a really small example so that we can kind of go from the lofty down to the real. Um, I uh, met with this couple early on and they were two micro, you know, software, software people. Um, wonderful couple, but they were, they had been very accomplished in their life and, and because they like things ship shape, you know, and I said, well, you know, this isn't going to be that kind of year, you know, you know, you might have to kind of accept some messy. And uh, there were lots of things we did uh, with their family, but one of my favorites where they are my heroes is see this mud pie, who wouldn't like a backyard with a big old mud puddle. So they were about to um, uh, landscape, you know, their backyard, they just built a house. And um, they, uh, I talked about the geography, there's actually literature on the geography of, of childhood and how much child, children love to build their own forts and, and build their own backyard. And they decided to just let the children, they had, uh, they had like a four and a seven year old, I think, do whatever they wanted in the backyard. So there's just mud holes, they threw some tires out there, they brought some fell, you know, some bro- some big branches down from the park because kids love to build their own forts. You know how people spend a lot of money on those fancy ones? They're building their own fi- forts. One of the things we know about children is they love to hide. They like to make things. So they like to get dirty. And so none of this is fancy. And I am so proud of them because they said, they, they sort of described it. This is a metaphor of radical acceptance of the mess of COVID year that they're letting their kids just have at it. Their kids are so happy. They, they want nothing more than to spend time in this muddy backyard. Hope that inspires you as much as it inspires me. I don't really mind coming into the office to work. Hmm. Pandemic, stress at home, pandemic risk of exposure. Hmm. Okay, hard decision. Uh, I, I kind of know what this guy's going to decide. Okay, I promise I'm not going to overwhelm you. I know you're going, oh my God, a PhD. She's gone nuts, right? Okay. I, I have two geeky slides. I love this slide. This is to make to sort of impress you with. Don't worry, we psychologists know. You know, we know where we're going here because it's been, as I said, there's resilience that's been studied for for decades. What these authors did, and this came out just last month in uh, our most esteemed journal, sort of our New England Journal in Psychology. But I'm just going to walk you through this briefly because I want to get get you so that you're thinking about your family system. COVID-19, of of course, leads to social disruption. Those of you who have job insecurity, financial insecurity, have a whole level of suffering in addition to the the rest of you that might not have that difficulty, but everybody's got difficulty with social uh, isolation and uh, and distancing. This, of course, affects your children's lives because they don't get to go out and be with their friends. And uh, those of you who have kids in elementary school, middle school or high school, of course, are really worried about the disruption of schooling, but also their social and emotional uh, learning. Okay, so then you're gonna get social disruption, of course, affecting parent well-being. And then look, this is what we call bi-directional. Parent stress and mental health affects children's mental health and adjustment. 
and children's stress and their behavior affects parents and back and forth. And, and the way they affect each other's stress in, systems actually affect their immune systems. If you think about the release of cortisol with stress, you know, then our adrenaline gets going and we get heightened. And because we're social animals and our children are so connected to us, you can, studies have shown if we're releasing cortisol and you're studying the uh, infant even, you'll st the studies have shown that their cortisol is raised as well. Their stress is called circular anxiety, right? It goes back, we're infecting them, they're infecting us. This is why getting to calm is so important. Okay, so now you see also, of course, the, the parent well-being is going to affect the whole family system. You have the parent-child dyad, marital subsystem, sibling subsystem, and then you get within this the concepts of communication and organization are involved in our secure attachment system, affection versus hostility. Of course, then you've got the whole family, family ambiance or milieu that's affected by this circularity of, of stress. And then, of course, I've already talked about beliefs. We'll get through this, you know, one day at a time. We're going to have good that comes out of this. We're going to control what we can control and accept what we can't. All of that, of course, affects the resilience. Now, all of this, uh, of course, lies on a previous life that could in also, uh, you know, in include economic hardship, racism, and marginalization. Uh, the mental health of parents or family, um, and of course, history of trauma. So of course, if you had risk there, it's only heightened with some of the stress we have now. Okay, so that's just the background. This is the list. Um, this list has been around, again, for decades. We have all the greats, Michael Rudder, Ann Maston, Norman Garmacy, these people that, I think I gave my first grand rounds at Children's Hospital on resilience. Well, let's just say last century. Um, now, because this is a short period of time, I'm going to just focus on the, they, of course, they're all kind of interrelated, but in terms of being the predictors of best outcomes, let's just get back to number one is the parent-child relationship. Um, we're going to talk about the getting to calm, self-regulation, and that uh, other piece of um, uh, accepting negative emotions. Um, I want to give you a, another thing I want to stress is realistic expectations. I saw this family uh, soon uh, at the end of spring, June, and they uh, they both have artistic, you know, kind of design uh, backgrounds, and they thought a really good idea to to sort of make a project out of uh, COVID year uh, because they had so many skills was to remodel a couple of rooms in their house because they actually had the skills to do all that and keep their business, their work life alive too. The problem was they had a three and a five-year-old and they actually thought that they sh could play for hours at a time without um, difficulty. And I don't know where they got this idea. Uh, I, I literally was flabbergasted that you could have two smart parents that thought kids could play. I, I don't know if mine played together nicely for, I don't know, a half an hour, you know, maybe all the way through age 18. Uh, so you know, it doesn't take a psychologist to know that was a, a pretty high goal. So at the very least, we need to have realistic expectations for what's, you know, typical child development because they were getting so mad at each other, so mad at their children. And all we had, had to, do, well, I said, fire me now, but I'm going to say, okay, we got to revamp this whole system of expecting that they should be able to, you know, kind of get along that long. So let's always start with realistic expectations. They adapted, you know, we, we made some changes. Um, okay, let's talk about some little victories. For that family, it was just changing up the, the idea that, that that was a reasonable expectation. This is actually a big one. Probably one of the, you know, there you can do so much online right now, or, or you can do it on your phone. There's you know, Insight Meditation, there's the Calm app, there's, uh, there's uh, Headspace, um, but you could join a class, which of course then becomes even more tailored to you because it's a class, but taking a mindfulness class, again, people keep talking about lost opportunities. And I think, well, you can take a class on mindfulness. Uh, you probably get the farther in improving your family life with a parenting class or a mindfulness class, it, you know, compared to anything else you could do. So that's a, you know, all you have to do is sign up and do it two hours a week. And then of course, 
from meditating every day, but it's, it's, a, it's a big endeavor, but it's a, it's a good one. That's a victory. Uh, what, one of the things I've done with doing these webinars all over the United States is um, I love to have people share their little victories and then I share them with you. But a mom and son decided to uh, cook together. That was their little hobby. Um, a family that writes and performs plays. You know, the way you do this in Montessori is you start with your kids just deciding a, a, a little event or a little crisis, and then you build every day. So you practice it every day the same. So they were doing that as a family. Uh, families that do little talent shows, you know, the third grader that can do the harmonica and the three-year-old that can, you know, show uh, their new drawing and painting, but, you know, you perform for the grandparents. Uh, FaceTime chats. I'm telling you, there are so many of you have the cutest kids. I know on good days, you know, they are the cutest kids ever. There is nothing better for some of the people out there with pandemic depression than receiving a call from your adorable kids and just do a FaceTime. And again, here's something they want to share. Uh, you do know, remember how cute your kids are, right? I mean, all of them could call somebody I know on FaceTime and be the peak of their day. I mean, that's what a win, win, win. Um, board game nights. Okay. Mana from heaven. Uh, in my book, I call it miracle grow because one-on-one -on -one time is one of the most important things for building the relationship there is. And to remind you of what child initiated child centered time is, you know, like it's not a time where you will socialize or guide in any way. You're the sports caster, Oh, you know, you wanted to put the the you know the wagon in the in the train set, and oh, you want to take the train set and put it on the shoots and ladders set. You just appreciate whatever they're doing. It's not a time short of destruction to property or person. You're just enjoying them and being amazed. You don't have your phone anywhere near you. You can't see it or hear it, and you're just mesmerized and admiring their ideas or just sitting and appreciating them. 10 minutes, I know it's a lot, but boy, if I had my spreadsheet and your schedule, I know I'd put that as number one. It, it just, so often when kids have behavioral problems, when parents just increase special time, the problem goes away. So that should always be number one as a consideration. And of course, this is the big time, date night. You know, I, you know that phrase, I don't know where it came from. I gotta look this up. Um, you've got 12 eggs and you're going to put them in a basket, you know, and you apportion your interests, you know, you got 12 eggs, where are you going to put them? When I meet with families, I'm always, almost always saying, could you take a couple of the eggs out of the parenting and the kids centered basket, all the stuff you're doing for your kids, worrying about your, could you put it into the marriage basket? I'm always wanting more in the marriage ba basket. And now that you've seen that family system slide, you know why. So I have a parenting group and it was great that they all committed to doing a date night, even though we don't have time, we're too stressed, we just want to veg. No, you make a date night, you figure out where to stow the kids with somebody or someplace, you get a good dinner, you, you, know, you go there, you have an adult movie and you know hopefully a lot more than that, but nurturing the marriage is all important. Okay, some of you are saying, well, what if I can't get any of those victories? Okay, well, you could consider instead of a whole new routine and healthy, you know, broccoli, um, that maybe you shouldn't do anything. Maybe you need to work on radical acceptance of self and other. You know, we have a phrase uh, that you, you should do, you know, hold two opposing truths at the same time. I want to radically accept myself and I want to work on a little change. So notice that the dosing is heavier on the acceptance part than the change. This is a truism. If you're just listing, I have a mom that I was working with recently and oh, she was, oh, I can't even tell you how impressed I was with two weeks of progress. She was really frustrated with her daughter. Her daughter was in fifth grade. She just had this list. She's bad attitude, you know, disrespectful, won't eat what I make for her. Then she steals food from the kitchen. She just had on and on and on and on. And I, you know, God, it sounds really hard. But I said, what, you know, I had this feeling. I said, how about you do absolutely nothing? The great husband, very much a perky, happy, ready to go guy. I said, how about if she does nothing but love on this girl for the next two weeks? I mean, you know, if she has to, to say, you know, okay, 
something's here, you got to do it. But you know, almost everything is no change agenda, just basic maintenance and just appreciating her. And in two weeks, she came back and she was amazed at how much better uh, things were. Because you know, kids kind of know when you're thinking about you should really be different and I'm really disappointed in you and I'm kind of you know uh, disapproving of a lot of you. They know when that's the karma coming out. And so just go, I'm only going to think about her assets, that she's a good student, that she's a good babysitter, that she is um, you know, funny, that she actually does a lot of stuff. Right. Just think about what's going right instead of all the laundry list of, of wrong. And anybody can do this intervention and that's different than, okay, we're going to change up, you know, we're going to have a, a star chart for more chores or something. So the next question you're thinking is, what if I really have a colicky family? I love Roz Chas. I love her. Thank you, Roz, for making these, this slide. I love this. So I don't know which one of you you are, but the basic thing is, you know, we're going to talk about focusing on yourself. But it's very hard when your family is, is stressful. And there are many considerations, but a, a, a metaphor I want to want you to think about is uh, fishies are only as healthy as the fish tank. Okay, it's the air they breathe. It's that whole idea of psychoneuroimmunology again. So if your fish tank looks like that, yeah, it's stressful. And of course, there are, some kids are harder to raise than others, and there are temperament issues. Oh, I put that little family system slide up so that you could remember that's what we're talking about. Temperament, their age and stage. As I said before, what are the uh, pre-crisis uh, stressors, the functioning? So the key of all this is, is small goals, control what you can control, and they can be really little, like 10 minutes of that child-initiated or child-centered time that you add to the day. Or, you know, it's bad day and you say, okay, time to look at animal videos. And you just, you know, everybody perks up. If you haven't looked up animal videos, I've just created another good moment for your life. They are, you know, where the dolphin is playing with the lab, you know, and doing, swimming around in circles. Or the elephant has adopted the pig in the rescue center. Okay. One, I should have put that in my victories list. Okay. Now let's talk about this mom. And this mom is poor mom. She had a delusion of grandeur uh, that uh, her kids were gonna, you know, she's gonna buy all these materials and she's gonna have, um, you know, uh, an organized home and everything will be really ship shape because, you know, she's a planner. Well, you know, and then her day turns out, I love this. Her day turns out like this, you know, kind of some public health problems there maybe, but um, really if she's chilling out and just giving up on the day, that's probably even better than, her having one of these days. So um, in psychology, we often talk about problem solving on three levels, that you want that proactive plan, okay? And accept that, you know, you're gonna have a routine, but you also wanna be flexible. You're, you know, that holding two truths thing. If we're gonna try for the schedule, which would be stability, that's good, but we're gonna be ready to change it up and be flexible, okay? And of course, then, when things start to go south, we want to intervene as early as possible because, you know, when we really start yelling and screaming, which probably is the biggest, the two things I'm hearing about from families is I can't stop nagging and I can't stop yelling. So those are the two things that parents are most worried about with the contamination of that fish tank. So we have prevent things as much as possible with a good plan. Okay, then we want to intervene as quickly as possible if it's going south, so maybe we can send kids to their room for, you know, calm time so that they don't end up slugging each other. Or I end up take going and taking uh, some deep breathing somewhere so I don't end up yelling, right? Because I can see my steam coming up. So that's, so this is my second, my own, only two geeky slides. It's really important. I think every single human being should understand the science of stress. And this is just a basic, science on stress uh, slide. The X is heart rate, okay? All that stress means is it's a physiological arousal. That's all stress means, physiological arousal, okay? Anxiety is when you get stuck in it and you can't get out. Okay, so the Y is performance or how, how what is your behavior like? So a little bit of stress is good because we, we move from passive to stimulated, creative, focused, effective, 
And then we hit optimal performance, whether it's tennis or parenting or building something or whatever. We've got optimal performance. Then when you have too much uh, adrenaline, which is released with you know, an, an amygdala hijack, as we call it, those little structures behind the eyes that perceive threat. When you're, you really get a hijack of that system of fight flight, then you're gonna move down in effectiveness to this range. So first, when your heart rate goes up and you're really getting stressed, reduced effectiveness, less attention, indecisive, unfocused, anxious flooding. I call this the flood zone, right? Irritable, can't think. And if it's chronic, it's burnout. Okay, and this is the meltdown area. Now, um, one, so, and uh, when you're in that, that, that area, you can't think straight. Okay, we call it uh, all or none thinking, uh, you know, catastrophic thinking, mental fil filter, meaning you only think the bad, you don't remember the good, like that mother I talked about earlier. And, you know, the, the conversation in the uh, one spouse's head is, you know, uh, he never does anything. He's always doing email. I have to deal with all the crap. Um, he's never around when he needs to, when I need him. Notice always or never in mental filter, right? Um, and he's over there going, God, I can never make her happy. You know, I do so much work. I do, I just try to keep meeting her needs. And, you know, all I hear about is the bad stuff. And she never appreciates how I'm always trying to make her happy. She's never happy. Okay, that, that might be his script. But that's extreme thinking about negative thinking about your partner. And it could be just as bad about the kid that the kid is always like this, never like that. Um, you know, you're just thinking about the, the, it's called negative affectivity bias. We're brought to the, you know, the negative stuff. You know, like if there's a car that's wrecked on the side of the road. We always look at it. All humans look at negative because it saved our lives at one point, right? To look at the predator and, and, and have the fight flight. Unfortunately, as parents, we look at things that threaten us and trigger us. And then we're treating or thinking of our loved ones as our, as our enemy and they feel it. And then round and round we go. So that's why this is the flood zone. So a lot of people say, oh, there's nothing to do during COVID. And I go, yes, there is. We can develop our emotional intelligence. So the first stage notice is self-aware. We wanna be really aware of our heart rate, of our decibels, of the intensity of our voice, of our extreme statements to loved ones, because we want to stop here and early intervene and do deep breathing, getting to calm, get distracted, get do all sorts of strategies that I'll review in a minute so that we can move away from the flood zone into optimal performance as a parent. I have all of these um, uh, mantras in uh, my books like, you know, don't just do something, stand there, because often, you know, we get mad and we have our mouth open and we're talking. Uh, or, you know how we have that phrase, don't drive under the influence. And I say, don't parent under the influence of high emotion. It's just as destructive as alcohol excess to be under the influence of extreme emotion. So this is emotional intelligence, is knowing we want to stay out of this range and have that pause so that we have the freedom to choose. Okay, so in this range up here, we, you know, that's distress on a, uh, on a scale of one to 10, anything over this range uh, on a distressometer, you'd wanna sort of take a measure so that you could intervene on yourself and um, get out of the flood zone. Okay, so this is a protocol that I have in all of those three books, but it's basically the first and most important is early intervention to cool down and get that heart rate down. I have an asterisk because we'll come back to this in a minute. But once you can get down to that middle range, you get your brain online again because you have no access to your prefrontal cortex, your thinking brain while you're flooding. Some people have appreciated that I have this phrase, emotional uh, uh, epilepsy, uh, that you know we never talk to somebody when they're having an epileptic uh, episode, right? We know that they're offline. But when our kids are screaming and hysterical, they're offline. And the idea that you'd say, now you need to get yourself under control. You know, I only yelled at you because, you know, you hit your brother and you can tell they're offline. And we're often off, offline too, when we are yelling or excusing ourselves or whatever. So the whole thing is, you know, get that heart rate down. Then you can think about options. Then you can apologize and repair. Then you can make some plans to uh, maybe figure out how to do the schedule differently or intervene differently on a problem. 
So an article, again, from Parent Map that was published uh, last month um, was 20 strategies. Now, again, you've read, all you parents have read so much about eating well, sleeping well, controlling media, go outside, um, exercise, play more. I wanted to start with, hey, go for good enough, realistic expectations. Find some supportive friends. Some people are finding that they're picking different friends during COVID because you know other friends for whatever reason might not be available. Your two best friends might not want to walk outside. They they feel like they need to stay inside. Whatever it is, there's some there's some shifting going on. And then we've got the five positives to one. Anybody want to bring that up in the Q and A? Children do not accept influence from tyrants. So unless we're mostly positive, all our other parenting schemes kind of go out the window because the kids don't cooperate with people that they perceive as tyrannical. So we've got to start with that, you know, honey and sugar, you know, in the bank account before we can um, we can make a change. But I really want to now just talk about a couple of very specific getting to calmer techniques. The one I I don't know why I I. I like many techniques, but if you're not going to become a mind, you know, a mindfulness guru, if you're not going to take a course and learn how to meditate, that's okay. You know, you might not be ready for that. You might not be ready for running three miles. You might not be ready to, you know, become a vegetarian. It's okay. Everybody's going to choose their little um, goals in life. But this is a quick and easy one, which will absolutely get you back in the working zone for choosing your approaches to your children. It's called the four seven eight. And I like it because you have to concentrate to do it. And often when we're really mad and we, even if we go to the bathroom or we go outside to take a moment, we might say, I'm really mad because they deserve it because this is just killing me. I can't stand the way they are. This We actually recount our res resentments and we can stay all steamy. So the idea is to get your heart rate down. And if you have to concentrate really hard, you can't think those negative thoughts that keep your adrenaline and cortisol release, right? So this one is you have to get your belly out or you might hyperventilate, but you get, you exhale all together. I'm just gonna imagine a bunch of you doing this. You inhale for four seconds. You hold on for seven. You open your mouth and exhale over eight. And then you do it again. So you have to four, seven, eight. But you see how you have to concentrate? I can't tell you how important it is that there's something you can focus on getting your heart rate down where you can't, res you can't recount your resentments. Okay, it's really important. We can only really focus on one thing at a time. We can toggle back and forth. But if you're only focusing on the breathing, it, it, it's guaranteed. It's a science experiment. Okay, now a lot of people like the four square, holding on for four seconds. I mean, you, excuse me, inhaling over four seconds, you can use your finger. Then you hold it for four seconds, breathe out over four seconds, and then hold that for four seconds and do that over and over. Um, I really like the five senses. If I'm doing an emergency phone call uh, with uh, you know any adult or adolescent who might even be suicidal and really losing it, maybe... I'm trying to talk them off the, off the ledge. I do. I really recommend the five senses because again, you really have to uh, focus. And I have parents go to the window. I just like the window because you can look outside and you say, what do I taste? What do I smell? What do I see going through and observe, describe? What do I hear? And what do I feel? You probably feel your pants. I feel my scarf. You know, I can feel my ring on my finger. So you just... By doing this, you're grounding yourself uh, so that you can get that heart rate down again. You have to concentrate to do that. Now, the big one is, again, science, science, science. It's called the dive reflex. And as we evolved as humans, um, we had this incredibly adaptive thing that evolved in our, in our um, biology where if you are in cold water, uh, then you have this immediate... Um, uh, heart rate that goes down because your heart and your brain are um, optimized for survival. 
And so you can get that heart rate down like that by cold water, a cold press to your face for 30 seconds. Most people laugh at this going, I'm really going to put my face in cold water. I go, try it. It really is effective. And you can, you don't want to make your kid do this, but if they are hysterical, you can offer a cold washcloth. When they're really hysterical, they just, you probably should just be a loving presence. Notice how I'm talking about us regulating ourselves. A lot of you are saying, oh, my kid is so hysterical. I want the, I'm going, uh uh, uh. doctor, heal thyself first, right? Parents need to work on their own regulation. Having an agenda to be coercive to get your kid to calm down is problematic. I recommend that parents model, 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 model. Maybe suggest, you know, if they're coming out of the meltdown to say, would you like one of my earbuds? I'm listening to music. No, no. If they're still in that rejecting stage, just go back to being quiet. Even trying to rub their back, they may hit, hit you. And when they start to get that heart rate down, they might accept comforting and then a reset reboot. Um, so in closing, adopt a positive mindset, the pause, routines, negative emotions, some maybe, you know, repeating, repeating, what you're grateful for every night and writing it down is predictive of good outcomes. So, you know, writing down is very powerful. It sticks in our head more. Name it to tame it. We, we say about na naming our emotions can be another thing, a journaling exercise. And then uh, because COVID is so complicated with what we're doing with remote learning and our uh, work shifts and um, all the planning. I really think parents need to take an extra time, not just to have a date night, not to just keep up with what's going on, but to really say, okay, now what do we need to revamp around here? We, it's like running a small business. Um, and I always love to live with, I leave with this uh, benediction, if you will, from Mr. Rogers. Love isn't a state of perfect caring. It is an active noun like struggle. To love someone is to strive to accept that person exactly the way he or she is right here and right now, and to go on caring even through times that may bring us pain. That would be now. Okay, with that, I'm gonna stop this part and we're gonna do some Q&A. Laura, first of all, thank you for always your intense amount of wisdom, science, and experience that let's just say I had the parent map peanut gallery in the background saying we don't yell we don't raise our voice we don't you know so really really helpful um a lot of positive comments around helpful tips around schedule and how important things are like that and so we'll kind of just dive into the questions um, one parent says, I'm at a loss. It's my daughter's eighth grade year. She's missing out on so much with her classmates. Mates. We're home indefinitely because my father has stage four pancreatic cancer. How do I make this a meaningful year for her while she isn't at school? And I'll add on, there's a bunch of questions around how to keep things positive and how to stay, keep the feeling in your home positive when everyone is so stressed and right. feeling it. Right. Uh, that's why I always like to talk about the acknowledgement of losses as well as what can we do? Because, uh, so I'm really glad I emphasized that. Um, eighth graders, uh, well, every single year I'm finding there are special reasons why it's tough, right? Eighth grade is tough in the same way junior, senior year is tough. And the seniors last year that missed their graduations and their proms and, and it, it was so hard on them. And then wondering if they're going to college and you know what's happened with college. So everyone, we do need some time to acknowledge losses. I wanna really emphasize that. Um, maybe even journal about it. And then once you know you've given that honor, then you know if you say all of that is true, what can make our life a little bit better, right? What could, what could we do that's a little creative? Last week, I heard uh, this one group of uh, girls got together and they pretended they were, uh, there was a real homecoming. They, uh, they didn't buy anything. I think they switched clothes, but they spent like three hours, you know, getting all dolled up and then they wore dresses and then they went to some restaurant out in back of their house. Eighth grade could be the same thing. Let's have an eighth grade dance. 
okay, a dance party. Three of your friends will do it on Zoom. We'll spend hours and hours on the playlist. But it, little things can make them say, how can we perk up? I've, uh, Elaine, I've read, uh, uh, just read three novels about World War II and uh, the London Blitz. How did they get through these moments, these little perky moments? Because you want to do the loss and then you want to do something creative. Should we start a watercolor uh, class online? Should we decide to make three different kinds of ethnic meals? Uh, you know, learning about, you know, uh, everything from Middle Eastern to Japanese. You just want to be a little creative about the perks so you can make uh, moments of, of good times amidst the acknowledging the negative. So it doesn't have to be positive all the time, but I'm amazed how just even, like I said, an animal video, if you had, I don't know, five minutes of laughs, that's five minutes of laughs. You don't have to have laughs all the time. You just want to, you know, increase positive emotions here and there and maybe some create, creative outlets. I don't know if, I think we're having a little technical difficulties. I know I froze, you're frozen, Laura. I don't know Am if you I? can hear. Oh, I can hear you, yeah. I've got my ethernet going full blast over you're here, so. frozen on my end. I'm having Laura. trouble on my end. So I'm gonna just throw, I'm gonna ask this question and hope that you can hear me. Yes, um, I can. Okay, good. If uh, there's, a, there's a person asking a question saying, these are great strategies, but they feel like strategies for neurotypical kids. Most things don't work with my low IQ, autistic, depressed, bipolar kiddo. How, what do, how do I deal when there's so little executive functioning? Yeah, well, none of this uh, was about uh, kids per se. You might've noticed <laughs> very little because I even said at the end, this is not, I, I don't want you going and trying to make your kids do those 20 strategies. Those for, were for parents. This is about parents getting sustenance that O2 so that they can be their best at whatever they're doing with their children, neurotypical or not. Stressed out eighth graders, stressed out third uh, graders and the lot. So I'm sorry if you thought this was about things you could get your kids to do to get to calm. None of them have to do with kids per se. It has to do with when we're at our best, whether it's the immune system, the stress system, uh, that milieu, the fish tank, then that's going to have a positive effect on your children. So I apologize if there was a sense that I was teaching about children's techniques. Yeah, sure. sure. Um, <clears throat> here's another great, great one. Children are feeling the impacts of so much uncertainty around how long the pandemic will go on. Social, social isolation, removal from school and daily routines are top stressors. How do you suggest parents deal with this effectively so that it does not scar your children in later life with ties to the other question around so much talk always goes on around kids falling behind academically. This ties into what about social emotional learning? Yeah. Okay. So that was two parts and they're both excellent questions. The first one has to do with, um, again, human, um, human science, the brain hates uncertainty, okay? We are scrawny little hominids that evolved to where we really had to uh, develop our prefrontal cortex in planning and cooperating and building and keeping ourselves safe and warm and developing society so we could really, you know, get more and more comforts and so forth. So the brain hates uncertainty. But that's adaptive, right? So if we know the marauders are coming over there, the flood's gonna come for the third year over here, we're gonna change our, so survival always rewards the people that can adapt. And part of the way we have to adapt right now is to accept uncertainty, that we know the vaccination will come, we don't know the coverage, we don't know when, we don't know the, you know, the dissemination system, we know something good will come. That's the attitude we want to take, but we don't even know when. Will it be a year from now that it's massive and how much will it cover and will we get to go to restaurants and go on? But we don't know. We have to accept that. But that's why I mentioned World War II because a lot of theorists right now are saying we have never lived in a in a, at a time where we had no idea what we were going to survive. So between the, the you know, World War II 
our grandparents, parents uh, in some situations did not know the other side of that war. And they basically did what we're doing right now. They had their kitchen gardens. They did what they needed to do. They didn't know if the men were gonna come down. The women went to the factories. They did the best they could with the situation they had and they wanted to stay optimistic about the other side of the war. We want to do that. You know, there's that phrase, our parents were, our grandparents were caused, uh, called to war and were called to sit on the couch. Well, we're, we're called to sit on the couch and it's really rough because those parents, grandparents who went to war were heroes. They got to be together. They were on a mission. They didn't know about the, uh, the survival on the other side. We know we're gonna survive, but we're really scared and all of that is valid. But I think part of it is we I need to accept that we've always had uncertain circumstances, but we've had it kind of cushy for about 30 years. Even with 9-11, that did not change our everyday life until we turned on the TV and got anxious again about terrorists uh, potentially, but it really didn't change our lifestyle other than TSA. So now we're going, you know, it's always been like this, actually, that there's been uncertainty for humans about the future. We do the best we can. We control what we can control. We learn about what's going on around us enough to be informed citizens and vote and do some activism for, you know, good ends and caring for other people. And then we get down to one day at a time, just like during other times of war or other times of pestilence. We, we focus on our family and our loved ones and we do the best we can. So I think we need to understand that this is part of the human predicament that we hate uncertainty and holding two things to be true at the same time. We can hate it and wanna accept it at the same time because it's part of the human condition. So that's philosophic. Now, Elaine, on your other question about social and emotional learning, this is a hot issue because uh, parents have been focused on falling behind academically, even though everybody's on remote learning. So, you know, you know there's a certain amount of, of uh, you know, playing field, you know, uh, level playing field there. But now people are rightly so going, gosh, with this isolation, are they gonna fall behind uh, socially and emotionally? Now, I, what I feel and others think is that with most people that are resourceful enough to do a conference like this one today, you probably are the people that are thinking about your children a lot and are trying to arrange some play dates or uh, pandemic pods and maybe some athletic things that you can share so that you're going through that rats, that re risk assessment tolerance and safety precautions and saying, we got to get our kids out there a little bit. They don't need a lot necessarily, but they need more um, than isolation at home. And the, the, the most psychologists said they, they feel like they will catch up because it will be a year, a bad year, and that they'll catch up. The ones that will really have the hardest times are the kids that are, uh, or the families that have other hardship, just as that one geeky slide show, just layered on of hardship and trauma. I think the families that are resourceful will figure out workarounds so their kids get enough exposure and that they'll catch up because kids are resilient, just like they caught up to some degree as a group after um, in the research that I had and others about um, uh, chronic illness, that they can catch up even after a year of spending uh, time in, a, in the hospital uh, with uh, some condition like cancer. They catch up for the most part. That would be the group data. There'll always be some that are just absolutely going through like easily. And there'll always be some on the other side that uh, will collapse. But for the most part, we think the kids will be resilient through this. Well, Laura, I am having, I am having technical difficulties. I think you guys can hear me. I'm apologizing. Yes. I cannot, I cannot get on screen. Oh, I wonder if I need to do the wrap up again. again. And um, there is a question if you'll share your slides and I will leave that to you. Um, if you're willing to share those, you'll let us know and we'll get those out to all the participants. Okay, and um, Elaine, let me just say thank you for this opportunity. And I hope 
everything gets fixed for your next one because I think you have another wonderful thing that comes after event that comes after mine at 740. And just in case Elaine can't say that, I'll say that for the group. Thank and again, you. thank you to all of you and good luck. And again, tiny goals, make it realistic, be really gentle and always prioritize self-care. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.